All right, welcome folks. I do recognize the other folks will still be coming in, but we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome, my name is Lauren Jones. I serve as the Director of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion here at the University of Minnesota School of Public Health. Before we begin, I want to first acknowledge that the School of Public Health at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities is built on the, the traditional homelands of the Dakota people. Minnesota comes from the Dakota name for this region, Minnesota Makoche, which loosely translates to the land where the waters reflect the skies. It is important to acknowledge the peoples on whose land we live, learn, and work as we seek to improve and strengthen our relations with our tribal nations. We also acknowledge that words are not enough. We ensure that our institution provides support, resources, and programs that increase access to all aspects of higher education for our American Indian students, staff, faculty, and community members. I also want to point out the automated transcript is available. You can access that by using the icon in the bottom, bottom right corner of your screen. You can also reach out to me or to Sarah Harris, who is providing our tech, tech support today via the chat to ask questions about accessibility. We'll monitor the chat for questions as well as share links to our evaluation and information about future justice and public health events. So thank you all for coming to the event. I'm excited to welcome people from at least 15 different counties in Minnesota. So all over the Metro as well as um, up and down state as well as folks from faraway places such as Texas, Connecticut, New York, and Florida. I think I counted 15 states in the registration. Um, our community continues to grow and we welcome you into the space to learn in community with us. The Justice in Public Health series was started last year as part of the School of Public Health's commitment to justice and anti-racism. We've been hosting monthly events with local and national experts around topics of public health. The speakers and presentations in the series help to ground us in theory and practice, as well as complement the classroom learning that our students experience. We also hope that today's discussion is part of broader change happening outside of the School of Public Health. If you're interested in staying abreast of other Justice in Public Health events, please be sure to fill out our evacuation after this and check the box to receive notifications about upcoming events. You may also visit our website at any time, um, and this event will be recorded and will be available to view on our website in a couple days. I want to welcome our speakers for today. Joseph L. Graves Jr. is a professor in the Department of Biology at North Carolina A&T State University. He's a fellow of the Council of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. His books include The Emperor's New Clothes, Biological Theories of Race at the Millennia, and The Race Myth, Why We Pretend Race Exists in America. Alan H. Goodman is a professor of biological anthropology at Hampshire College and a former vice president for academic affairs. He's past president of the American Anthropological Association and co-directs its public education project on race. He's a co-author of Race, Are We So Different? among other books. Please welcome our speakers today and I will give it over to them. All right, I'll share the screen. Thank you. So I hope everybody can hear me okay. I'm Alan Goodman. I'm gonna be doing a brief introduction, mostly focusing on the book and how the book and the talk interrelate. They have the same topic, racism, not race. Um, the, talk, the talk is really a, mostly about um, why racism, not race, is a cause of health inequalities. Um, Joe's going to be taking the middle segment and the bulk of the work, the meat of the talk, and then I'll do a quick wrap up. So yeah, the, this talk is based along our book that was just released at the beginning of 2022 called Racism Not Race, Answers to Frequently Asked Questions, and I want to tell you a couple things about the book. Next slide, please. That's right up the one doing the slides. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so um, the book um, is 
meant to provide a concise and accessible answers to key questions about race, racism, and human variation. And these questions have been called from a number of sources, principally students, educators, lawmakers, family, friends, et cetera. And it's really aimed at those who want to work towards both better science and human equity. Um, and it's also for readers who are nervous about saying the wrong thing, the little, um, little um, dialogue box at the end of the cartoon is an example of what we're trying not to do is just have an argument about who's racist or who isn't. We're trying to move beyond kind of that sort of argument. And the two groups, as we said, the, those who are nervous about race and those who are moving towards human equity, they often are the same individuals. Next slide, please. Wrong direction. <laughs> Yeah. So a little bit about the content of the book and, um, you know, that we start at initial chapters and what we're calling setting the table, understanding the basics of race, racism and human variation, then moving on to questions specifically about how race historically became so important, um, then into the biology of genetics and race that Joe will touch a little bit upon. Uh, then into what racism is and isn't, and then highlighted in blue are the two chapters that most relate to the talk today uh, on health and health disparities and why do races differ in disease incidents, and then life history, aging, and mortality. Next slide, please. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, and then also into other kind of myths of race having to do with athletics, bodies, abilities, brains, behavior. Um, and then also in blue, we'll talk a little bit about what a world without racism might look like at the end and uh, very briefly how we can, how we might get there. Next slide, please. Um, so just to give you an example of some of the questions that we have in the book, and there's over a hundred in total. Uh, for instance, chapter one on history, deals with you know questions of when did race begin? Did the Egyptians, Greeks, and Romans have a concept of race? Uh, what happened in 1492? On to the intersections between slavery, colonization, and race at the end and then whether or not in the 20th century, Jews, Italians, and Irish, and other individuals, why they may have been thought of as separate races. Next slide, please. Um, and then the two chapters that we mentioned, I mentioned that have most to do with the talk today on public health and health disparities. Um, chapter four, we start right off with why you might be asked about your race by um, your doctor or in a doctor's office or why you undergo a test um, to some specifics about race-specific diseases or the myth of race-specific diseases and um, from simple diseases to complex diseases. Next slide, please. And then finally, um, to things like what myths about whether or not Blacks seem to age slower, uh, important issue of life expectancy, variation by, weight, by race, uh, birth weight and infant mortality by race. And just to throw in a quick graphic at the end, um, this book was largely written before the COVID pandemic. But um, as we've seen with the COVID pandemic um, and looking at variation in case rates by race and also in, in fatality rates or mortality rates, um, there's some glaring health inequities by, by race. Next slide. And I think this is back to, to Joe. Thank you, Alan. Um, so you may have heard the expression race is not a scientific concept. And this statement has become a platitude amongst many scholars in the humanities and social science. But the reason this statement fails is because it conflates two very different concepts. 
the biological race concept, which has gone through a history and a formulation that is somewhat different from that of the socially constructed or socially defined race concept. The biological race concept began um, in post the ages of European discovery with examining what people look like, their morphology, and then in the 19th century moved to geographical location. And I, and I wanna make the point that's often um, not understood by people who think about the, the history of biology is that these first two concepts of race were driven by special creationism. In other words, this was at a time in which natural theology and in, in the Western world, predict, particularly Christianity, determined what biologists thought about nature. And none of what they thought came into contradiction with the idea that there had been an act of special creation or acts of special creation, which you know Luis Agassiz championed when he made the argument that there were in fact different species of humans and not different races of humans. Now in the 20th century, concepts, biological concepts of race moved on um, to being uh, associated with the frequency of genes. And this was made possible by the unification of Darwinian natural selection and Mendelian genetics. I also wanna make the point that the, this concept of biological race was not in any way focused on or centered around human biological variation, but in fact, biological variation in all species with biparental inheritance of which humans happen to be one. And then later on in the 20th century, the concept of cladistic race in which a group group within a species may can be considered a unique evolutionary lineage um, came forward. Now, I want to make the point that in modern evolutionary biology, we have dismantled every single one of these aspects of the biological race concept. So there are not, particularly within our species, biological races based upon physical traits, on geographical location, on the frequency of genes within populations or between them, nor are there any unique evolutionary lineages. Now, this concept is different from socially defined race, which arbitrarily utilizes aspects of morphology, geography, culture, language, religion, but only does so in the service of a social dominance hierarchy. In other words, the reason we entitled our book Racism Not Race is because we wanted to make clear the point that it was racism that drove the definitions of the socially defined groups called races in the Western world. Now, again, I wanna make this point clear. From what I've just said, you should recognize that our species anatomically modern humans does not contain biological races. And note, this is different from the existence of geographically based genetic variation, which we again discuss in our book as existing, as being important, as being wonderful, um, but that is not the same as saying that that geographically based genetic variation is enough to define unambiguously groups of human beings into biological races. Now, I'm gonna quickly run through why that's true. Um, in the early 20th century, uh, an American population geneticist by the name of Sewell Wright um, developed his population subdivision statistics. And this was a way to essentially examine the amount of genetic variation in the entire species versus any arbitrarily defined subgroups. And so those subgroups, of course, are often continentally based with regard to, again, anatomically modern humans. And so uh, Wright calculated a threshold by which you would say, yes, if this value exceeds um, this point, then you can legitimately say that um, subspecies or geographical races exist within that species. Um, but below that point, you really can't say that. Now, you know, we've done studies of, you know, of biological variation, genetic variation, a variety 
of species, including large-bodied mammals. We've shown that there are, in fact, large-bodied mammal species like gray wolves, Grant's gazelle, African wildebeest, that do have enough genetic variation between their subgroups to name and identify geographically based biological races. But our species does not. So when we look at, for example, you know, genetic variation within our species, on the left-hand side, we are looking at genetic variation between genetic loci that code for specific proteins. And now, so I know that not everybody in our audience um, is a biologist or is familiar with modern molecular genetics. I wanna point out that the human genome, uh, only about 1.5% of the human genome actually codes for proteins that make a human. Now, another five to 6% codes for regulatory regions around those proteins. And so only about seven to 8% of the human genome actually faces natural selection. And so in those regions, we actually see very little differentiation between human populations. And as such, natural selection has really sort of smoothed out human populations. And that in conjunction with the high level of gene flow that exists between human populations, we don't see a whole lot of differentiation. So for example, on chromosome five between African and European samples, the FST value is only 0 0.085. For chromosome nine, 0 0.087 and so on. Now, Wright's threshold value for naming biological races, by the way, is the number 0 0.250 or about one quarter of the way in which this statistic can go. So we don't see that in our species, anatomically modern humans at all. Now, we do see, on looking at the column on the right-hand side, when we look at those segments of the genome that are not facing natural selection, that are essentially neutral, that have really no impact on our physical traits whatsoever, we do see elevated levels of differentiation. So on chromosome five, it's 0 0.121, 0 0.122, and so on. Now, for those of you who've ever taken a DNA ancestry test, I want to point out to you that the signal that these DNA companies are using to try to determine your ancestry comes from genetic variation on the right-hand side of the table, not on the left-hand side. For the most part, humans are most different in the attributes or the uh, portions of their genome that have absolutely nothing to do with the attributes of those humans. So it's a way that we can trace ancestry, but it doesn't really tell you anything about the physical traits of the humans involved. Now, to further demonstrate the point that I made, if you look at the bottom panel, we see a series of pairwise comparisons of this FST statistic based upon East Africa as the starting point. Now, the reason we begin in East Africa is because our species anatomically modern humans first appeared in that region of the world and was there for about 240,000 years before anyone left Africa. So, the migration that populated the rest of the world occurred in the last 100,000 years of our species existence. And now as a result of that, what you see is that there's a continuous spread of this value from very low, meaning that populations that live very close to each other share a lot of their genes in common, to groups that are very far apart, meaning the further you are apart by geographic distance, the less of the polymorphisms in the genome that appear are shared, but none of these points ever exceeds Wright's threshold of 0.250. I also wanna make the point for people in the audience that when we talk about the human genome, that on average 99.9% .9 is shared by any two people chosen from any two random points on the globe. Furthermore, if I take two people, one group 
or one pair, one from Africa, one from Europe, and then I take another pair, two from Africa, the two people from Africa and Europe on average are going to share more of their genome in common than the two people taken on average from Africa. And that's because the greatest amount of genetic variability within our species is found on the continent of Africa. And that's actually illustrated by the top slide, which shows as we move away from East Africa, the amount of genetic diversity actually declines, and it declines in a linear fashion, which says that the major force reducing this genetic variability is the random force of genetic drift. In other words, due to small populations involved in global migration, they accidentally lose genetic variants, reducing the amount of genetic diversity in those populations. And so these arguments make it very clear that in fact, while we do have geographically based genetic variation, we don't have any means to unambiguously apportion people into so-called biological races. It just fails. Now, as we pointed out, we do have examples of strong selection that have led to adaptation in particular environments. But you will note it's not in the stuff that people who make a big deal about supposed great differences in humans actually talk about. So for example, in malaria zones, there is a lot of adaptation to malaria. Now, where are these malaria zones? They're in Southern Europe, they're in the Mediterranean, they're in the Middle East, they're in India, all the way to Southeast Asia, but also in West and Central Africa. Now, there are different genetic adaptations dealing with malaria, but some of them are shared. For example, the hemoglobin S variant that causes sickle cell anemia is found in Southern Spain, it's found in Sicily, it's found in Southern Italy, it's found in the Saudi Peninsula, it's found in India. It's also found in West and Central Africa. So when we look around at these traits, we don't see particularly any of the ones that are uh, we call complex traits that are um, determined by large numbers of genetic variants. So the only complex trait for which we have strong evidence of local adaptation is height. Note, intelligence and personality are not on that list. And so we'll talk about that later. So quickly, now we're going to talk about what, why this matters for understanding health disparity. So we're going to start with simple Mendelian genes. And in this case, once again, I'm going to use the example of sickle cell anemia. Now, what you see here, um, and this slide is courtesy of my colleague, Dr. Andra Dayrup of the Department of Pathology at Duke University, is the sickle cell S variant is found widely distributed in Central and Western Africa, but it's also found in Southern Europe. It's also found on the Saudi Peninsula. So you can't use this genetic variant to determine relatedness or, de or determine whether someone belongs to a supposed biological race or not. The thalassemias are also found in Southern Africa, in East Africa, in the Mediterranean, in the Saudi Peninsula, and so on. Now, not surprisingly, when you look at the areas of Western and Central Africa, where enslaved people were taken and brought to the New World, those areas overlap strongly with high prevalences of hemoglobin S and hemoglobin C. And so we find in African-Americans some amount of sickle cell disease. But and here's a point, by the way, that I had to make to a physician at a very prestigious Ivy League institution last week. This person thought that the reason that the frequency of sickle cell S was so high in Central Africa was because the genetic variant first originated in Central Western Africa. So I had to point out to this person that in fact, the reason it's so high is because malaria transmission is still occurring in Central and Western Africa at high rates. Because the populations that I just pointed out 
that became enslaved and made up the African ancestry of African Americans had the same frequency of the sickle cell S in sickle cell C variants as Central and Western Africans. And that, that frequency is about 0 0.140. But the frequency of sickle cell S in African Americans is only 0 0.01. So it's more than 14 times or about 12 to 13 times lower in African Americans. And that's because in the latter portion of the 19th century and the 20th century, malaria transmission in North America was pretty much eradicated. And so therefore the advantage of having a heterozygote carrying the sickle cell trait disappeared. And now you're dealing with the classical case of selection against a deleterious recessive allele and the frequency of sickle cell anemia in African-Americans dropped dramatically. Now, that is not me saying that sickle cell anemia isn't a problem in African-Americans because when we have 330 million people of which 12% are African-American, if you take 1% of 30 million people, that's still a lot of people who suffer from sickle cell anemia. But the point I'm making here is that sickle cell anemia is rare in African-Americans because malaria doesn't transmit at the levels that it transmits in Central and Western Africa today. And so I explained to this physician that the prevalence of sickle cell anemia in Western and Central Africa is really the result of poverty, not because the allele first originated in Central and Western Africa. So now, another point that I need to make, and this is again, really important with regard to understanding health disparities. When we look at the people that we socially define as African Americans, their ancestry is at least 15% European. Now this happened because of the forced rape of African women during chattel slavery. And we know that because of the direction of Y chromosomes and mitochondrial DNAs in African Americans versus European Americans. So we have, you know, if, if the um, slave narratives aren't enough to prove to you that this happened, the genetics definitely shows that that happened. Now, this, however, this average European ancestry differs depending upon the portion of the country. So in the southeastern United States, it's around that you know, 14, 15% European ancestry. But in places like West Virginia, it's north of 30% European ancestry. In Washington state, it's north of 30% European ancestry. So while these individuals are socially defined as African American or Black, they have a great deal of their genome resulting from European admixture. Now, this is also true of the people that we call Latinx. And their admixture is even more complicated because it results from three ancestral populations. So for example, people from Puerto Rico, on average are 72% European in ancestry. They are 16% Amer Indian in ancestry and 12% African. Now, that differs from the largest Latinx group in the United States, Mexican Americans, who are only on average 46% European ancestry, 51% Amer Indian ancestry, and only about 3% African ancestry. Now, in countries like Colombia, you see a pattern similar to that of Puerto Rico, but depending upon which state you are in in Colombia, you can get values of African ancestry close to that of African Americans, like in the state of Choco, which is right next to the city of Medellin, which shows the standard um, average for Colombia as a nation. And finally, Peru, where the individuals from Peru are 80% Amerindian ancestry and only about 2% African ancestry. Now, of course, to make the point, in the United States, persons of European ancestry socially defined as white are less than 2% African or Amerindian in their ancestry. And this is simply because the rule of hypodescent meant that any 
detectable African or non-European ancestry meant that that person was socially defined as an other. And, and this is why European Americans have such high frequencies of genes that originated in Europe. So now, again, what does this genetic background tell us about understanding health disparity? So one of the points that, that I've made consistently is that when we look at the genetic contribution to lifespan, it differs dramatically by socially defined race. So for example, in a study that was done in New York, European Americans had a heritability of, for, for lifespan of about 0 0.3, which is in fact quite high for that complicated trait. Lifespan, generally the highest that I've ever seen is about 0 0.333, and that was taken from a, a cohort of Swedes. So 0.3 for European Americans, but for Caribbean Hispanics in New York City, it's only 0.150. For African Americans in New York City, it's only about 0.1. Now, what does this actually mean? It means that for these groups, okay, the heritability is an estimate of the genetic contribution to lifespan. And so therefore, Caribbean Hispanics and African Americans could actually live a lot longer than they do, but because of environmental influences, they don't come close to living what they should be living. Whereas European Americans, because of their position of social dominance and the institutions of structural racism that support their social dominance, come closer to realizing their genetic potential for lifespan. Now, I, I've cited a bunch of studies below here that show that, for example, when African immigrants come to the United States within one generation, they take on the mortality profile of, of African Americans, profiles they didn't have in their native country, which once again shows that these health disparity differences are not driven by genetics, they're driven by environmental conditions. So let's see if we can get this thing to work. So quickly, um, this is data from National Vital Statistics of 2017. And what I have plotted here for you is the black-white mortality ratio for cancer and heart disease. And you know, for folks who think you know, racism is gone, structural racism doesn't exist anymore, um, when you look at data like this, it's hard to come to that conclusion. So for example, the um, heart disease rates across age, so these are age-specific profiles, go from around 2.25 times for African Americans at the youngest ages and you know, close to identical at the later ages. Now, I want to make the point for folks who, who may not recognize this, that it's not surprising that these rates converge on identity at late age, because by that time, pretty much everyone's dying anyway. So what's really interesting and problematic from the point of view of health disparity is what's happening to people at younger ages. So when you see these disparities in the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, that's really an indication that something's out of whack. So for both cancer and heart disease, we see that African-Americans die more at, at higher rates than European-Americans do. Now, I, I could do this for all other socially defined race, races in the United States, and I have, and you can read about it in our book, but for today's discussion, I just chose these two. Now, um, what's interesting, of course, is when we look at environmental variables like household income versus mortality ratio. So for people who make more than 70,000 a year, they have the lowest mortality from biologically based diseases. But as you go to lower income, the ratio climbs. So less than 70,000 or about 70,000, 1.36. 50,000 a year, 1.45. Okay, 30,000 a year, two. 20, less than 20,000, 20, 2.49. So now we're getting around the ratios we see in the black-white comparison and toward people at the lowest income the mortality ratio is three relative to the reference of people making more than 70,000. 
So I think this is a strong indicator that, again, what we're seeing are not genetically based differences driving mortality, but environmental differences. Now, and finally, with regard to the genetic argument, um, since we're talking about complex disease, the, these diseases are contributed to by genetic variants found at, at positions all along the human genome. And so therefore, if we can measure how much of the human genome has bad, and I'm putting bad in quotes, so deleterious genetic variants in different populations, we would have at least our null hypothesis for what the genetic effect on lifespan and mortality should be. So when this was done, comparing European and African populations, it turns out that European Americans have more genetic variants that are probably deleterious, meaning bad, and African Americans have less. Now, again, that sort of makes sense based upon the pattern of human migration in which genetic drift had a larger of impact on European and East Asian populations than Africans. And so therefore they could accumulate by chance alone more bad genetic variants. Africans, because they maintained larger populations and stayed in the same place, didn't. So what this tells us is that if I were going to make an assumption about the genetic causation of disease, I would predict that people of European descent should be showing more disease than people of African descent, but that is the exact opposite of what we see in the United States. So I'm gonna let my colleague, Dr. Goodman, take us home. Thank you, Joe. That was um, really terrific and great detail. Um, I just wanna make a quick comment before I wrap up that, um, uh, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we'll get to them at, in a couple minutes. So I wanted to say a, a couple things. We want to say a couple things in ending about, you know, how do we move ahead? And, um, you know, and so we have a chapter that's titled A World Without Racism, question mark. And um, one of the ways certainly is that we can't get ahead without acknowledging that racism exists. And one of the places we see it very clearly is in public health, you know, that CDC has declared racism is a public health issue. And that was great to kind of finally acknowledge. Um, however, there's a lot of headwind and you know one of them is to acknowledge a lot of the Republican Party unfortunately um, I hate to play politics here but um, doesn't even realize that racism is is alive and well and this is a quote from Nikki Haley um, in August 24 2020 just as we were wrapping up our book, our conclusions to the book, uh, Nikki Haley, who was born of Sikh parents and who immigrated to the United States at when she was ambassador to the UN, um, says, in much of the Democratic Party, it's now fashionable to say that America is racist. That's a lie. America is not a racist country. Well, again, we're not calling individuals racist, but the the proof is in the health statistics that there are racial inequalities that can't be explained by anything but the lived experience of race. Next slide, please. Um, and compare that to Kamala Harris, um, who says a little bit more reflectively, um, just last year, May 31, Vice President Harris says, here's the truth. Racism exists in America. The work to address injustice 
wherever it exists remains the work ahead. And Harris, by the way, is also the mother of, Indian, of an Indian American who married a Jamaican of African descent. Harris attended Howard University and strongly identifies with their African heritage. But at least she's making, the important point is she's at least making the step to acknowledging that racism exists in public health, health differences, wealth differences, et cetera. Next slide. Yeah, I think we, we skipped a slide on, um, but let me just, on, I think it was, before, Joe, if you maybe go back a I second. Go back. Okay, um, go back a second, all right. So let's share the screen, let's go back. But I missed the slide. What did I miss? Oh, yeah, I did. Yeah. Yep. And yeah. So, and also, just as we were writing and wrapping up, um, this book um, was um, after the murder of George Floyd. And just to say again a little bit about the back currents that we're working in, and still today with 2022, you know, around critical race theory around um you know around other um, around the teaching of race the 1619 project and um joe especially but both of us as students of the history of white supremacy really unfortunately predicted in the book that um there would be you know that trump would try to remain in power and would try to energize his white supremacist and fascist base so that's what we're at today and i'll just uh, you can turn off the slides joe i just want to say one more thing is that um we're at a moment in which some individuals are trying to have it both ways that to say that well genetics accounts for something of the racial difference and for instance this comes out in a recent book by Paige Harden um called the genetic lottery in which she tries to sort of say well genetics counts for something and may count for something in racial differences um you can't, as Joe, I think, has really said, you know, there there is no thing as racial genetics. And so when we see racial inequalities in health, you have to begin to understand the processes by which racism gets under the skin. So thank you very much. And we now have a bunch of questions in the chat, so or a bunch of comments. So I'm going to try to see if I, I can take this from the start. Um, there's a, uh, unfortunately, we can't do questions verbally. Um, this is, I think, for you, Joe. Does your H2 data suggest that about one third of the health status of a population would be determined by genetics if social factors were more favorable to all? Like if well, you had the experiment. I, uh, yeah, yeah. So, the bottom line is, you know, one needs to be very careful about talking about heritability, period, because heritability is always determined both by the population in which it's measured, um, as well as the environments in which it's measured. So while I won't say that heritability would move towards 0.333 for everyone if environments were equalized, what I will say that if environments were equalized, whatever the the calculated heritability would be, would be equalized for all populations living in an equal environment for several generations. Because one of the things that's going to prevent that from happening right away are epigenetic modifications to the human genome, which are passed on from generation to generation due to various forms of trauma, which past generations hold. So when I do those kinds of measurements in my work, we, we don't even begin to take those measurements until we've equalized the environments of our organisms for at least two generations. So that's what I predict would happen. Um, there's one comment that's directed at you, Joe, and uh, somebody is saying, thank you for bringing up epigenetics. Um, we 
don't have any other questions. I don't know if anybody wants to quickly put a question in chat. We have a few more minutes. The moderator or anybody has other questions for us. Um, I think this is a really important area to be delving into. So um, if you have questions about the genetics, Dr. Actually, Gray. I see one, Alan, that's pretty interesting. And this is from um, Dr. Alpara, who says, thank you for the outstanding lecture. I have colleagues, collaborators who are part of a health equity research network. They're doing work with RNA and transcriptomes and want to look at how it might impact, Im impact maternal health equity. I am not comfortable with this because of the very premise of the question exactly goes against what you spoke about. How would you advise me to articulate my disagreement? Well, the first thing that I would do is to talk to them about the effect of the environment on the various epigenetic modifications and how the populations in question have never shared a common environment. And so therefore, you know, and in fact, we talk about this in the book that people have used epigenetic modifications um, to measure as biomarkers measuring stress. And not surprisingly, African-Americans show higher levels of various forms of epigenetic modification than European-Americans do. And that is directly correlated with how long individuals live. And again, that's because of the trauma that African people face in the United States due to structural racism. So I think those measurements are important to take, but it's a question of context. How do you explain the results? So, and again, if you'd like me to speak to your colleagues, I'd be happy to do so. Okay. So there's a question, do you know of any medical programs that teach this material? How about I'll start, Joe, and then yeah, go ahead. you can, I, Joe has been doing lots of grand rounds. Um, you know, this, um, as you probably know, um, public health programs and epidemiology programs, I think, have been ahead of the curve compared to medical schools and um, really understanding what race is and what race is and, and back to the basics that Joe talked about at the beginning of the difference between race as a measure of human biological variation versus race as sort of a sociocultural concept that's been created and relates to the lived experience of racism. Um, and I think the medical establishment though is beginning to come around. I mean, this is reflected in um, the National Academy of Sciences that Joe talked to earlier this week and trying to understand and come to a consensus about how race and ethnicity and other measures of variation are being used in biomedicine. Um, me medical journals, some of which are beginning to not allow one to use race as a genetic descriptor. As for medical schools, you know, I worked with the University of Illinois a while ago to try to get their curriculum to really grapple with what race is and what race isn't. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Joe, who's really done a lot of this work. Yeah, thank you, Alan. So over the last year, I was uh, picked up as a consultant for Elsevier um, for the revision of Robin's Basic Pathology, the 10th edition, um, to remove most of the racial misconceptions that exist in that book. Um, my colleague in that has been Dr. Andrea Dayrup of Duke's um, Pathology Department. She and I together have done close to 50 grand round lectures at medical departments around the United States, including um, two days ago, we spoke at Stanford's pathology department. And so the landscape of this, we spoke at Minnesota's medical school about a month ago, uh, but the landscape of this is that in physicians think typologically about human biological variation. They think that race is real. They think it's important. They think they have to discuss it um, when they look at a patient vignette. And so we've been working diligently to try to overturn this false science. Um, we have 
already made headways with the National uh, Medical Board of Examiners with regard to questions on the exams that will remove these kinds of vignettes. But there's a long way to go because they still, you know, they've been trained this way. Um, you know, we, we wrote a, uh, a opinion piece for the New England Journal of Medicine that came out in February where we talked about how, you know, medical schools could change the criteria for admission, including asking their students to take courses in biological anthropology or evolutionary genetics so that they can come in the medical school prepared to be able to understand these issues. But the long and short of it is we have a long way to go. There's a question, um, would it be helpful to allow local communities more power over how their health resources are used? Um, Alan, you want to take that one? Well, I, my quick response is that I'm speaking to, I think, a predominantly public health audience. I think folks probably know the answers as well as we do. You know, my gut is to say, well, of course, um, that always in local you know, communities know the issues they're facing, know power relations, et cetera, know what their needs are. Um, better than outsiders, even anthropologists tend, tend to understand. Um, but there probably are a, a couple ca caveats that sometimes outsider perspectives get at things like power relationships and, and things of that sort. So, yeah. yeah and and I, I would go on to say that the, the real problem that we're facing now is a question of power with regard to what does it mean to, to be a healthy person and how do we achieve that? So, you know, the, the main, you know, bulk of biomedical research of university related science of private related science, they're all trying to fix you, assuming that the environment, the toxic environments that we live in have to be that way. And so when I was speaking, you know, to the pathology department at Stanford two days ago, question came up about, you know, well, what does this mean for the development of personalized medicine? And my response to them was, well, you know, we need to ask the more fundamental question, which is, what are we trying to do? What are you, because I'm not doing that, but what are you trying to do personalized medicine for? Are you doing it for the goal of trying to make people healthier and to expand medical treatments for people who need it? Or are you doing it to make more billionaires, more billions of dollars? And then the entire conversation went silent because in fact, that's what that research is really about. It's about pharmaceutical companies making more billions by tailorizing treatments to people who have insurance or are wealthy enough to, to afford them. And so I said, if you really want to address health disparity, then what you need to do is support uni universal health care so that people can see doctors on a regular basis, so that they can have their prescriptions instead of making a decision about, do I, do I buy lunch today or do I buy my prescription? Do I keep the heat on in the house or do I buy my prescription? Do I keep the lights on or do I buy my prescription? So if we wanna equalize health in this country, it's not about more biomedical research. You know, Sequencing transcriptomes is not gonna do it. It's gonna be a fundamental revisioning of what we believe our healthcare system should look like. Thank you. So there's a comment that I think only we uh, can see that uh, recommending Ann Morning's book, The Nature of Race, How Scientists Think and Teach About Human Difference. And uh, the commenter says that's fantastic. And we agree um, our, and we know Ann. Um, and I think if we can probably share later on some other key resources that relates to their couple comments about um, the science, which is pretty technical, um, FSTs, et cetera, um, and how to kind of present it in a, you know, is there a way to kind of get to the, I guess, the bottom line or et cetera. Um, and I'll start by saying, you know, I think if I can say read our book, I think we, we try to break it down into very clear and accessible 
chunks. Um, there's an old documentary that we're part of that needs to be updated called Race, the Power of an Illusion, the first hours on science. It needs to be updated, but everything we said in there in 2003, I guess, still works. And I, I think that's a very accessible piece. Um, the project that I'm part of um, has a website called understandingrace.org. And for those who are in Minnesota, I really strongly recommend going to the Science Museum of Minnesota and looking at the museum exhibit on race that's at the Science Museum. Joe, do you wanna add to that? Yeah, I, I think those are all fantastic resources. And again, I'll say what Alan said, read our book. We spent a great deal of time attempting to distill what's some pretty high level science into, you know, as he said, bite-sized digestible pieces for people who don't have a, you know, high level of scientific background. Great. And I think what might be the last question, which is a good place to end on, is a comment, a question about you know, how does understanding the science of what race is and what race isn't kind of really help us to fight white lies of white supremacy? And um, yeah, so. So Alan, you wanna go first or you want me to go first? Well, um, I, I'll go first and to say that I think um, the science is insufficient because we also need the political commitment, but it's absolutely necessary. I think one of the, you know, I've said this in other presentations, it's a crude kind of metaphor, but um, the idea that biological race is real is like a gun in a rate, the hands of a racist. Um, if you take away the gun, they may harm you in other ways, but they're not going to shoot you dead immediately. And um, that, so we have to disarm and we can disarm with science. And so it's, I think, part of the reason we have been so unsuccessful. I'll just say one more thing. You know, Obama wanted to have a national conversation about race, but he never got, they, that conversation never got to the very simple but fundamental question about what race is and what race isn't. And until we do that, I think we're not going to be able to face white supremacy in a unified way. Yeah, and, and to, to give an example that really brings what Alan said home, um, many of you may know about Robert Jones's book entitled White Too Long, The History of White Supremacy in American Christianity. And if you don't recognize the, you know, clear contradiction between the use of the term Christianity and the most racist people in America, because, you know, sociological surveys have shown that white evangelical Christians are the most racist people in America, then that's the row we need to hoe to be able to make movement in this country around addressing structural racism. Those are the folks that put Donald Trump in the White House. So about uh, now three weeks ago, I spoke at the BioLogos com conference in San Diego to an audience that was 95% white evangelical Christians. And when I explained to them both in terms of the lecture and also the podcast that I've done on the site, that the idea that biological races are real is in fact scientifically false, you could see the wheels begin to spin in their minds. I mean, at my own church, which is a historically white church, when people began reading Alan and I, my book, wheels started turning. It caused them to confront a deeply held belief in the reality of biological race. And, and I'm gonna tell you, if you don't know, the majority of Americans think that biological races are real. Okay, most Americans are genetic essentialists. So we need to do this science. But as Alan said, the science alone isn't going to win the day. But it's a very important starting point to pull the rug out from white supremacist claims about innate differences between people. 
Thank you, Dr. Grace and Dr. Goodman. This has been so good. Um, we really appreciate all the folks who've been engaging with us in the chat. Um, Dr. Grace and Dr. Goodman have also put their um, contact info uh, there for you to reach out with some of those other questions. Please fill out our evaluation. And we are so appreciative of you coming today. We hope you have a great rest of your day. Stay safe, be well. Thank you all for Thank the- Thank you, everybody. Thanks for attending.